and greetings programs and welcome to this week's episode of the awesome friday podcast my name is matthew and i'm your host and this week i am joined it's a very special episode because i am joined by the uh pc jg as that is the pan canadian jkg appreciation society uh, <laughs> uh, and that is to say, I'm here with Simon, as usual, and welcoming Hello. back to the show is uh, Rachel, our very good friend. Hi, Rachel. Hey. Hello. Single round of applause for you. Welcome back, Rachel. Yay. Good to be back. Uh, good to be and, yeah. back, boys. Do we, big, uh, fan, big fan, Rachel. Big fan. I do read your reviews and go, oh, yeah, shit, that's really good. Like, <laughs> 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 You know when you, you try, you're, when someone else is writing stuff that you also write and it just makes you a tiny bit angry? You know, when it's just like, yeah. oh, just if I, yeah. So, yeah, enjoy your enjoy your film reviews very much. It's always lovely to have you on the show as well. Thanks, yeah. Simon. And uh, and you have the best voice of any of us. So you do. I think, I think oh, you, my God, you do. You bring us up a whole letter grade in terms of listenability, I think. So. <laughs> so. Uh I'm just happy to be able to talk about Jake Gyllenhaal. That's all I really wanted to do. Yeah, oh my god, we're gonna, it's going to be great. Like I'm not, I'm a straight man, happily married, and not questioning any of that part of me. I'm very happy with my route in life, and I, I'm, a dra- <laughs> I'm a drama major, so I have had ample opportunity <laughs> to, to to learn which way I uh, my preferences lie, and I am completely solid in that. But holy shit, ah, Jakey. He he defies straight, bi, really queer. Nuts. Doesn't matter. He defies yeah. all of that. He's just Dick yeah. Jalen Hall. He's the best. Yeah. He's the yeah. best. He really is. He He's really singular, is. except for that his sister is also one of those people for me. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. She's fine. She's there. It's good. She's good. I I don't I don't I find her very compelling in a way that I don't. I, I don't mind her. I find her. I'm very indifferent to Maggie. She seems good i mean maybe it's a coin flip situation because i think jake gyllenhaal is an amazing performer but he doesn't like you know flip my switch like he does for simon he's not he's not uh, tim blake after all is he man? uh and i mean no he's no he's no lee pace is what i will say <laughs> oh my god so lee pace on lee pace i've just watched um bodies 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 and i was maybe a good chunk of way into that movie where I was like that's Lee Pace isn't it? Is that yeah. Lee Pace? It I took me a while too I have he to say a watching He is and he yeah. is so good in that film. He is uh, I, I, I recognized him immediately is all I will say. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I've also wow. watched like you know all of <laughs> All of Pushing Daisies and all of Halt and Catch Fire, uh, and in, the, in Halt and Catch Fire in particular, which goes through several eras of like the computer revolution, he is like several different looks at, to wow. end. They're all good. They're all good. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> and, and of course, he's uh, he's fully naked in Guardians of the Galaxy as well, so you can get your kicks from that too. Yeah, naked and he's blue, which is I don't know. Well, I don't want to sound Cap- racist, Cap- but it doesn't quite Captain do it for Ash. Me, but <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah. So how I mean, you I think the thing you guys connect over really is your love of JPG. So I'm glad you could be no, on here to talk about there's many things. There's many things we connect, but this that's the peak of that mountain. This is it really yeah. is. Wow. Jake well, is the, Jake's, Jake's everything. Jake I mean is the life. connection the connection between you two seems to be like you know the bow on it for you two seems to be JKG, which uh, which she... whereas for me and Rachel it seems to be Elvis, which is good. <laughs> 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 I feel like if we ever go down that road and start talking about nineties action movies, I feel like Rachel oh. and I would be it. like two parallel lines screaming yes. towards the same conclusion. Like I just get that feeling. So I one, one day, day I don't know when and where we do that episode, but yeah, that has to be a thing. Because yeah, yes, sure. that is that is another we completely we completely hijacked poor Dakota's episode talking about speed. <laughs> <laughs> Let's screaming at each other about speed. You know, I, I listened to that episode, and let me tell you, uh, it was apparent. I know he edited it too, but it was very apparent. He did. He did. <laughs> no, he did. He was solid <laughs> edit on that. Yeah. Um, I also just want to say this is not a video, but I just did a genuine spit take. Where <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Beautiful. See, did that's a genuine why I love you. spit take. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> well, um, um, I mean, so first off, I think. 
the other thing we need to talk about just just to just to tie back into this a little bit though because it is our connection what what is today's elvis fact rachel oh i actually recently found out a funny thing was a, a somebody i know online uh because i am part of an elvis discord channel because obviously i am um <laughs> i'd be disappointed if you weren't at this point i know i know uh, they went to a they went to graceland in, last week and they took a picture of a portrait of elvis and i had never seen this before it's the only portrait that he commissioned in his lifetime of like he sat for it and he got paint. It's this massive, like four by seven foot oil painting thing. And the story behind it is, it was this guy who did, I did pull his name up. Um, Ralph Wolf Cohen is the painter and he is like a big deal in the portrait painting community. He's, painted uh, monarchs around the world and like presidents and everything like that so there was a time that he was like the guy he set up an office in uh what is it caesar's palace in vegas for whatever reason and johnny mathis and had commissioned a work by him and they used it for uh an album cover i think and then elvis asked johnny mathis like can you hook me up with this with this guy because i love it i want it elvis shows up to his um thing his studio and standing in i like to imagine he's standing in the doorway and he basically asked this man cohen cowan sorry um can you paint me nude and ralph thought he's joking he's not actually going so he made like a bunch of jokes it turns out he was serious he genuinely really wanted a nude painting but then um, i guess elvis got a little gun shy after he got made fun of kind of thing so he had this painting done and it was he the only request he made was that it be a foot bigger than Johnny Mathis's painting. <laughs> that's, that's an Elvis thing. So when it was ready to go, Elvis, it was still wet on the canvas, but Elvis really wanted it. So he went to Vega, he went to the Caesar's Palace office, picked it up and carried it out of the studio by himself. This massive four by seven painting with still wet and i just imagine him walking around through the lobby of caesar's palace and then into his um suite at the intercontinental which is now i think or i don't know what it is now it turned into the hilton eventually but point is he had that painting in his room in graceland when he died he kept it all those years that this was in like mm. the late 60s when he did this it's not really a fact but just a fun little story that i discovered about all this that's recently. a that's a great story and let me just highlight the fact that I really enjoy the way you're pronouncing the name Graceland. What did I say? Graceland. Graceland? <laughs> it's like Maryland. Isn't that yeah. Graceland? Yeah. Maryland? Yeah. I mean, it's, isn't, it, isn't it two words, though? Like, it's Graceland. It's not... I'm, they write the it guy... as one word. I will say they write it as one word. Graceland. I don't know. I'm not one to, I'm not one to talk because I'm actually being serious because I'm the guy who, like, my sister drove a Chevrolet car for a long time, and I often refer to it as their Cavalier, so... I <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about it. Yeah, you're right. It is Graceland. I just think of Maryland and I say I go yeah. Graceland. I, yeah. um, Rachel, which single Elvis song is the most Elvis song? Like one song that is pure Elvis. Like you get to choose <laughs> one and all the others get deleted for infinity. And this one song remains and it is the symbol of Elvis. Which song do you choose? Like what if Elvis was a one hit wonder? I'm not sure there's <laughs> any universe. I'm pretty sure that like well, Elvis no, no, no. being what a if... huge star is a canon event in every universe. What? <laughs> <laughs> you have to choose one. For the, the sun is imploding, you've got one chance to send one Elvis song. It's a very small flash drive and a very small spacecraft. And they're going to send it off into space to symbolize Elvis. Which song do you choose? Oh, no. <laughs> I've broken you. Like... Oh, yeah, it's it's got to oh, no. be Suspicious Minds. It has to be sus Suspicious Minds, surely. No, but no. <laughs> it can't be. It's, there's two. Okay, can I just give two? I can't, no, I can't. The flash drive only has space for one MP. What? Okay, okay. I, I will say, my fine, my runner up is, is, <laughs> is a cheesy. gospel song, which is Peace in the Valley. And the oh, reason yeah. I oh, picked that song. is because... One, he sounds gorgeous in it. He sounds gorgeous in every song that he does. Mm -hmm. But it is a very, like, gospel music to me is the biggest side of Elvis that I think for a long time probably went unappreciated. And I think to an extent still does today. And that's just because gospel music, generally speaking, is not as appreciated as others. Um, but 
I'm not a religious person in the slightest, but I will listen to his gospel music all day. And I think Peace mm-hmm. in the Valley, when you hear him sing it, I think the reason I like it so much is because his life was so chaotic then. he had, There's a great clip of him on the Ed Sullivan show um, singing this. And his life then was so nuts and just so ridiculous. But that song, to me, when he sings it, it's like there's such a peace and a calm that comes over him that... I feel like that's where he found his kind of equilibrium in life was Mm -hmm. peace in the Valley. However, I would say if you do have to just choose one song, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's probably if I can dream, because I know that that's a very on the nose song to pick, especially after Mm -hmm. Baz's movie. But I just think that that's the one that it's, it's very unique in his um, list of songs that he recorded, which is like 700 plus songs. But I think that that is the one that was probably truest to the artist he wish he was, as in the songs that he wished he recorded more in his career. Mm-hmm. I think that that was the one. And then Jailhouse Rock is also really good. So there's that too. So that's three songs. So... <laughs> Clearly there has to, be a, a ma- has to be like a mashup situation. Well, we'll, we'll yeah. zip drive it. It's fine. We'll I say it. Power of Love also. that would That's a very, very Elvisy song. <laughs> Okay, you have to stop now. Yeah, anyways, yeah, anyways, continue. continue. <laughs> You're going to just list, list his entire song. You're going to list all 700 songs at this point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how many, just that, I don't want to go too far aside, but how many Elvis records do you own now? Like LPs, CDs? <laughs> oh, like, di- like digitally like physically, included? Like, no, like, or physically? Like how many physically do you own and then how much? I assume you just have every bootleg under the sun now because the internet is <laughs> available and fast. I do, yeah. Um. I would say for like, so I, I was buying the vinyl records of his and I think I'm at, I'm not at that many. I don't think I'm at that many. I've seen people who have a massive collection. I think I'm at, God, be 40, something like that. Maybe around 40. Yeah. But you're also been at this less than a year. So yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. It's, 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 a, it's, like, it's, it's been like, quick. That's like it's not more that than, that's more than one a week. If you average it out at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to I was on vacation in uh, in Japan and he was really big over in Japan and vinyl records are a really big market there or have always been a very big market there. Um, and so I bought a lot. I bought like 25 records. I think I came home with 25 records from Japan and Hong Kong. So there's that. That's where the bulk of it comes from. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you got the opportunity, why wouldn't you do it? Yeah. And now whenever I go down to the States, I'm like, oh, I should probably look at some record stores because I think they have a better selection of used records than mm-hmm. in terms of Elvis anyways, than we do in Canada. So that's the next thing this summer. Yeah, kind of there's a prop, there's a in Pike Place Market on the third floor down in Pike Place Market. There's a mm-hmm. huge uh, secondhand vinyl store. And that's a, that was a problem. That was an issue because you just need time. There's so much in there. And there were so many really cool limited edition and stuff I've never seen anywhere else. You know what I really appreciated being in? So I was in Tower Records in Tokyo and they had a, a, vinyl, a used record section. I was looking through. It is the most organized used record selection I have seen anywhere. I usually like here, if you, if you find a used record store, there's not really an order. It's mm. just, there you go. Here's all our used records. Enjoy, have fun. But they actually take the time to organize it. But they also make sure, like, I didn't get any ones with covers that had cracks or even folds or little scuffs on it. Like, they're very particular about which used records they decide to sell on. And I'm sure that's not every single store because Tower Records is obviously a massive chain. But um, I was very, very impressed by that because I, I'm just used to the used records that we have here. and. Mm that can be like a record cover literally in two pieces because it's it's not it's just old and it and is it's also it is. it's also just the difference between like the indie record store and a place like tower records that yeah. might be able to enforce standards on the stuff that they take in i but i went to one i only went to one smaller store in tokyo and they were just as organized i think it's just a japanese thing those guys I mean, are that, really on top of their yeah, shit yeah. Maybe, it's, like, maybe it's just that in Japan. That's, they're just yeah, yeah they're very very um what's the word they're very like fastidious about things like that. Like they're yeah. very picky and um, good on them. Good yeah. on them. Um, 
I'm just looking because now, now that I'm buying physical movies again, I'd kind of like to have a copy of the 68 special, but I don't think it's ever been released on Blu-ray. I said. No, no uh, it is only on DVD and you can only buy it. That they're, they're not making them anymore, so you have to look on eBay. I do own one. It's great. You have to spend a little bit more money on it. Yeah, um, I found well there, is a, there is one of those like 50th anniversary like CDs that also comes with a DVD. I know, but that mm-hmm. thing is going for like 200 bucks on Amazon right now. So. No, so what you want is the... Um, but I want the movie. Like, I want the recording. I think you want the complete... It's a three-disc one. That's what you're looking for. Yeah. That's what you want. Because you want all the outtakes, too. And then the, I'm currently looking for... I can find it online, but uh, I, I that's, found, that's I found the, the way it is. About. That's the one I'm looking for. I found the one you're talking about on Amazon. It's currently going for $245. On Go on eBay. I bought mine for 75 which is still a lot for, like, a DVD, but... Mm-hmm. well worth it you guys well worth it yeah i mean it's one of the greatest you know recorded concerts of all time still so yeah mm-hmm. i would say it is the greatest yeah. but you know that's just me, <laughs> that's just me. <laughs> i mean i think at this point we can establish that you are uh what's the word biased <laughs> so <laughs> i think you have a it's a it's actually it remains amazing to me how like you watched this movie and you were like, Holy shit, Elvis and just yeah, you just I went know. now you're yeah, just whole you, hog on the Elvis train. I know. And you you haven't wasted any time like none. getting that obsession in line, have you? That's no, really none. Nice. I, that's just that's just who I am, you guys. That, it's funny that, too, because right. I don't even I don't even like that movie. Like that bass movie. I just <laughs> I don't even like it. I what? don't think it's a great movie, but like I watched it and I was like, Oh, it really was if I can dream though. It's like I heard that song and I went, I didn't know Elvis recorded stuff like that and then I went and I like listened to the act like i saw the actual video of elvis recording it and i was like holy shit so so is this thing where you see one thing you like and you go from uh i might be interested in this thing to immediately to i'm gonna learn everything i can about this person and buy 40 vinyls in a year and keep going like is this a rachel thing yes is it this, is. is this how you deal with all things in your life it is like, yeah i used to say to my brother a lot i live my life like a hit routine like there's just either zero or a hundred i don't i don't really have an in-between i don't i don't take things lightly when i'm into something <laughs> i'm really into it i could i don't go like but then i'm a bit surprised it's gone on as long as it has however i don't really feel like it's gonna let up at any time i did think that maybe going to great now, see, now I'm self conscious of the way I say Grace. Grace <laughs> I'm sorry. Grace Lynn or Grace Lynn. Say it however you want, yeah. Grace Lynn. Grace Lynn. I thought maybe that would be the way to like temper it down a little bit. Like maybe once I go, then I'm like, okay, uh, now I've done it. How, but, how, 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 how do you just, how do you think that's going to temper it down by going to Graceland? Which I don't is like know. The mecca of Elvis. <laughs> it's like maybe if I eat just like 400 more burgers, I'll stop wanting <laughs> to eat burgers all the time. Like it's. I know it's the thing is though. I don't. I don't. I don't ever want it to go away either. <laughs> wow. Like I, it's cost a lot of money, wow. and it's it's been it's really consumed a lot of my life. But wow. I don't. I don't mind it. Like I don't want it to ever kind of tamper down, and I I hope it doesn't because I, I just I quite enjoyed it. I just love the idea of you watching a movie you didn't even like and being quite interested and be like, well, this is now who I'm obsessed with. Like, it's like, okay, this is now an obsession. I know. It's not just like, oh, maybe I like Elvis. This is this is no. instant no. obsession. I'm, I'm fascinated by that process. I know. It's weird. I do. I do fully acknowledge and accept that. But that is, it is in line with my personality of just going <laughs> full hog on something that's just what i do and uh yeah my book collections are very weird because you'll see like tons of books on a very particular topic and then it'll just stop all of a sudden and then it'll just be that <laughs> just, but i do have like sections of my bookshelf which are just devoted to one very very particular topic like i was really into um subway systems for a, a while <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Well, that's, I, I, have, kind of, I, understand, I have so I understand many that. books about subway like, systems. Subway systems are have, super interesting. They are. We don't have to talk about the movies. Let's just talk about Rachel's obsession. This is far <laughs> yeah. more interesting than the movies. But I, mean, yeah, I, I was very into wow. that. Which, which city has the best subway system? Okay, so I <laughs> this to me, I think you might find this interesting. Is the reason I got into it was literally taking the tube in London. It just oh. made me really fascinated. I was just like, uh-huh. oh, like this is. And then I would like go to. They have these tours in London that you can go to disused stations, mm-hmm. and they're all over the city. 
Yeah, yeah. So I started going to them, and then I started going to like bookstores that just were talking about transportation. I'm like, this is fascinating. Mm-hmm. And then I, any city that I went to afterwards, I'm like, oh, I wonder what their what their transport is like here. And then I would sit there and I would try to find books about it, and it just tumbled down like wow. that. And that was a solid few years. I still am very interested in it. If I go to a new city, um, I will, I will. But I have like books upon books and like encyclopedias about trains and stuff like that because I just find it really interesting. And then then just one morning you woke up and went, well, now it's Elvis time. Like some ways yesterday. (laughs) Today it's Elvis. Well, part of it was I don't travel as much as I used to. And so I don't get to see new Uh transit systems as much. I I was in, I think it was either Lisbon or in Porto. It was in Portugal Mm. somewhere. And I was very fascinated with how like flush their track is to to the the the, the, um, the platform like it, usually it goes deep like you kind of run mm. under so i was wondering why that was and then i ended up down a hole of about portuguese history and i learned about henry the navigator and it was a whole thing i wow. i really enjoyed that yeah but if i go to a new city whenever i travel now i still look up like i was obsessed with tokyo's um subway mm. system their subway system is one of the most fascinating things in the world um but yeah i i do that this El- they, Elvis is just an extension of all of that. It just happens that he was, um, he has a lot of music <laughs> that I can go into and a lot of movies that I am trying to work my way through. I am just over halfway through his filmography now. It's not good. I'm, I'm just sure going to put it the... there. It's not great. <laughs> yeah, fine. You know, the Tokyo subway system was planned out using algae. Using you know what? Sorry? Algae. What's algae? Algae. 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 algae? Yeah. algae. We, oh, we call we it algae here. Oh, okay. Oh, you algae? <laughs> like, Do you really say algae here? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, algae. They drew a map of the city and put this super, uh, this algae that is single cell, but it, it um, solves problems, maze problems. And they put food where all the major um, uh, locations were in the city. And the algae built a map of the most... Um, uh, efficient routes to each of the food networks. That's very interesting. And then they transferred that into the the outline of the so the subway system in Tokyo. One thing I'm interested in because Toronto's so bad at this is how cities adapt to um, sprawls and like just mm. a, a, a development because not every city is able to adapt to um, the city just growing physically bigger mm. by population and by geography and. Yeah. I think Tokyo has been really good about doing that. I think New York, well, New York actually, because they're um, kind of finite because it's, it's the Island and stuff, but Mm. um, London, I think has been really good at it as well. And I also love for London specifically is like, they've inspired so many other cities in terms Mm -hmm. of their transit systems. Like they were Mm -hmm. the blueprint for it. So when you go to, Hong Kong. Hong Kong was based exactly on mm. London's, and there's an obvious reason for that. But then you go to Singapore, and Singapore based theirs on Hong Kong. So Singapore mm. gets to say theirs is better, but then the reason theirs is better is because it came after. And I'm, then, a big, I'm a big yeah. fan of the Paris Metro, personally. Oh, yeah. Theirs is great, too, especially considering how old it is. Like that's like, Again, that's another thing I find fascinating, is that London, New York, Paris, the three of them have such an old system but yet it runs really well and it's actually really efficient. I know that the people who live there don't necessarily think that, but if you use other cities' transit systems, you realize how much better those are. Mm. Again, Toronto is shit. It's really, really oh, yeah. bad public transit system here. The We're only not thing connected. I ever need, the only ever thing that I ever need to remember that Vancouver actually has a very good system of buses and trains is to go to any other city in the world and try to take a bus. It's... <laughs> So I took the, it's called the Sky Train over there, right? Like Sky yep. Train? Yes. That's right. I took it in, <laughs> this is me being really, really um, patronizing person from Toronto. I got onto the one in, in Vancouver and I sat there and I went, this is adorable. I'm like, yeah. this is the cutest train I have ever seen. I'm like, look at this thing. And it kind of <laughs> reminded me a little bit of the DLR in London because it's, um, mm-hmm. it just reminds me of like a, it's like it's like a roller coaster ride for kids. Where it's just, <laughs> oh yeah, like, oh, absolutely. Right. My kids, my kids loved it when they were small. They would yeah. want to just go on the Sky Train just to ride the Sky Train. It's it, it's very clean. It's very um, it's not very big. The trains themselves, I don't think, are, are too too mm-hmm. big. But I've only taken it that one time that I took it, and I, it got me to where I needed to go, so it was fine. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just remember seeing them being like, "Wow, look at this thing! How cute!" And I was like, "I'm being really patronizing right now." 
That's yeah, cool. but that's okay. I mean, I think that's a legitimately normal reaction to riding the Skytrain for the first time. Yeah. It is pretty cute. It's just very it's adorable. Pretty, it's a very, it's very bright. adorable yeah. train. I mean, this is a movie podcast, so we should move on. But I do just want to look at <laughs> this by saying that I think actually my, my favorite transit system, specifically subway system that I've ever been on, is the one in Prague. Uh, and that's oh, because it's yeah, yeah. Oh, and that's great. just because oh, like gorgeous. two gorgeous. two things in particular, it's clearly built with all the Soviet money. Literally every mm-hmm. station is gorgeous. And this is but this the second thing is the most important thing, and it's a very I'm very tall and move fast because I have long legs <laughs> situation. All of the escalators in every single Prague uh, metro station run twice as fast as they do anywhere else in the world. And I, I love, love yeah. it so much. They've got a good system. They've like very good the system. escalators there, at the, you know, the first time I stepped on one, it wasn't, you'd think because they run basically twice as fast as any escalator in Canada, at least. Most people might step on that and be like, wow, this is really fast. But I stepped on it and went, wow, escalators everywhere else are really fucking slow. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Munich is gorgeous too. The Munich subway is scrubbed clean white tile. My friend left his wallet on it and someone found it and brought it back to the hotel. Like it's wow. just absolutely gorgeous. Amazing. I don't know if I took it in Munich. I went to Munich once, but I don't remember mm. if I took the subway there. I liked Berlin's system. Berlin's was really nice. Theirs is cool. Well, they're very honor system over there too. Germany. Super honor system over in Germany. Like they just yeah. you just step on. Like you you pay for a ticket, but. But then I also went, if I don't pay and then like a ticket inspector comes by, I yeah. do not want to get yelled at in Germany. No, like, that's no. just, that's going to be that's, so yeah. That's how they get you. That's the yeah. threat. It's like true. everyone pays. Like, <laughs> just don't shout at me in German. It's so <laughs> terrifying. And I'm like, I would be like, I don't know. So, and then also it's super cheap too. It's very affordable. Mm. System yeah, yeah. As well. yeah. But anyway, sorry, continue. But I think I think they also just recognize in a lot of ways that we don't in North America, that transit is a public good that should be funded. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Anyway, that's very much like the movies we're going to talk about today. <laughs> <laughs> um, in that, Jake Gyllenhaal is in one of them. I guess I don't know. I, I have no good cool. segue for trains to these movies. Um, uh, I mean, I would if we were talking about the second one uh, first. I guess maybe. But, wait, wait, wait! Uh, Jake, Jake was in a movie about a time travel train situation. There we go. There's our link. Oh yeah, the one I asked you about. There you go. So, uh, source code, about. which is. Did you a, watch it? Did you? No, enjoy it? Yeah. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen okay. it since we spoke about oh, it. Yeah. So. that's a fun movie with a super ethically dodgy ending. I think, but. It's, <laughs> but uh, that's part of the fun of it. That's uh, why I mean, it's fun. Which is it very though? similar to today's Jake movie? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I find. <laughs> yeah, there's a good segue. Um, yeah, not to go on about source code, but the end of source code, I think, I find legitimately upsetting. I, I don't know. It, oh. it really hits me in a certain way. Okay, don't spoil it because I. Yeah. I okay. Fair. Yeah, yeah. 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 But anyway, let's move on. Let's talk about uh, our first film of the day. Uh, now that we've been talking for twenty-eight minutes <laughs> about subways. <laughs> we'll just cover them. We'll just nip through them quickly. Yeah, it's fine. fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is the best and worst thing about having Rachel on the show, folks. Is that we can just <laughs> we can just talk. I mean, we can just talk anyway. But when there's a third yeah. person who can just talk with us, uh, we will just talk. Uh, and again, for for all of our Patreon subscribers, if you've enjoyed this, we also talked for half an hour for you, for you <laughs> subscribers specifically today. It's lost so, more where this came from. So go to the Patreon, which is patreon.com slash MC Simpson, and uh, pay $2 a month, and you get to hear us talking with Rachel yeah. about film festival movies and many other things. Yeah, it's pretty good. Anyway, uh, so let's move on to the show proper, and let's talk first about Guy Ritchie's The Covenant. Not to be confused with the 2006 Supernatural action movie starring Sebastian Stan, The Covenant. No, this is Jake Gyllenhaal <laughs> starring in Guy Ritchie's The Covenant. Um, and uh, Simon, why don't you take us through a, a, the briefest of plot synopses of this one. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a subtweet. Uh, when, I off, when I did a 20-minute synopsis last week. Um, uh, so, you're picking uh, up on that, are you? It's, it's, yeah, yeah, a little uh, bit. Thanks, thought thanks thought for the subtweet. thought it was so subtle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a movie with guys with guns. There you go. Um, oh, yeah. Jake Jake uh, Jake Gyllenhaal is a sergeant in the. He's a U.S. Marine. He's stationed in Afghanistan um, when the Americans are bring uh, introducing culture and freedom to Afghanistan. He's a major uh, part of that. Um, as part of his team, he's part of a team that goes in and seeks out 
the uh, the really dangerous stuff like the make the bomb makers and things like that and he uses translators and uh near the this is not really a spoiler but for uh, a very early scene um necessitates that he gets a new translator or interpreter as we find out later and uh he is assigned one and they go to uh, do a thing and it goes very, very south. And basically he is saved by his interpreter of being amazing. That's the first, uh, a third of the movie. And then, and really the, the latter half of that movie is him uh, deciding that he has a covenant. Um, <laughs> if you're not sure what that word means, wait till the end of the movie. Cause it describes, gives you the dictionary definition, which is basically <laughs> like someone standing up at a wedding and going, Miriam Webster defines marriage as the bond between two people. It's like uh, <laughs> the worst part of the movie, but by the, by that part, the movie's over. Um, he has a covenant, a promise, a commitment, if you will, to go and save, <laughs> to go and save Ahmed and um, fight the system. And there's a large part of this movie that is basically how terrible bureaucracy is. Yeah. Um, but that's the movie in a nutshell. I mean, <laughs> you're not wrong. I, when at, you're talking about that like end title card that describes the dictionary <laughs> definition of a covenant, I I saw that and I'm like, I thought if I thought this was going to happen, it was going to be in like the first frame of the movie, like right before yeah. the title yes. card. Yes, you know? it's exactly. so weird that it's at the end of the movie. And you're right; yeah. it's it's such a stupid add on to the film. But yeah, I right found it is. really odd that it was at the end yeah, rather right? than like, at the beginning. If you're going to do something wonder, super cheesy like that, you I, do it at the start. That's just that's I just would love to get a guy Richie drunk and be like, so they made you add that right. The Americans, <laughs> like, the Americans like, guy, I love your movie, but what if there's someone who doesn't know what a covenant is? I feel like, what if we spell it out for them exactly? Oh, and yeah. um, and I, I feel, I don't know, maybe it was his decision, but it's a, it's a very bad part of a movie that I actually really enjoyed even though it's three different movies and i i really really enjoyed two of them and the, the third one actually when he goes in and uraz his way into afghanistan to save ahmed um it was there's a video game i really like which is ea's medal of honor uh, reboot in 2010 which is t tonally almost exactly the same uh, the American Marines get stuck in Afghanistan, uh, or it might be Iraq, and um, basically have to ura their way out of there by being these heroes. And uh, I love that game, and it's incredibly problematic, like for Spectrum Warrior on the Xbox Wars as well, because there's a lot of glamorizing of the American military, like freedom force in this movie, and I'm kind of halfway split between... I'm really enjoying this movie and it's always compelling to see someone fight for what they believe in. Um, but especially the, the climax of the movie is pretty like, it's pretty strong American military propaganda right in the last like 10 minutes of this movie when he gets saved by the military might and it so, turns into Call of Duty. Like, I'm not sure how <laughs> I feel about these things. So I'm actually going to disagree very slightly because spoiler alert and I don't think it's a major spoiler, but it is a spoiler, so I'm sorry to anyone who considers it so. But, like, he's not actually saved by the American military. He's saved by a private contractor. And I find yeah, that but, but even brings... slightly more problematic. Yeah, but the, he, the, the contractor saves him by calling up the military. It's like picking up a phone and going, oh, we need the, this specific thing that is nicknamed, like, the Deathbringer. And yeah. we, we know that from a caption on screen. Like... And uh, he does say at the end, he goes, "If you had just told me who you were from the beginning, like yeah. we could have, we could have done this real quick. Basically, yeah. like I would have called them much sooner." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I um, I mostly enjoyed the movie. Uh, I think it's a very good example of a straight up the middle, like you know, not quite. It's not quite a dad action movie, but it's very mm. like it's, I, it's, scary. it's similar yeah. to what we talked about in the bonus round, where you know, it's it's a movie that if it had come out in theaters in the 90s it would have had like mm. a 60 million dollar budget and made somewhere between like 100 and 150 million dollars and we would be like oh yeah remember that movie from the 90s uh, this is that movie yeah this is a casting choice away from being a gerard butler uh yes yeah. action movie yeah. which he 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 has just released one which is looks very very similar yeah mission mission yeah kandahar, mission kandahar yeah which, yeah. Uh, kandahar. yeah you're right it's like that's, it's, that's the mirror of this film it's it's slightly less jingoistic and has mm -hmm. jakey g instead of uh, Jerry G, Jerry D, uh, who, and uh, who, 
And and it's a great example of how Jake just elevates everything. It's very done. true. I was gonna. I was hoping we would bring this up. Is that the right. movie itself? I think is very mid level. If you put any other actor in yeah. there, I think it yeah. would have just been whatever. But you add Jake Gyllenhaal, and all of a sudden, and I would like to say it's not not just Jake Gyllenhaal. Like yeah. um, the the like, actor who who plays Ahmed, the Dar yeah. Salim, he is fantastic in it. Yeah, yeah. I was two say, of them are really great together. Yeah. For me, it's it's actually more Dar Dar Salim. Than, I think the two of them are just Jake. excellent together. I love mm-hmm. I love the chemistry together. I like the way that they like, especially when you first meet when they first meet each other and they're kind of getting to know each mm-hmm. other and feeling each other out. Yeah, I really love those moments. I'm not. Are you guys big Guy Ritchie fans? Are you guys like on? on the so Guy it's interesting because I, I obviously Guy Ritchie when he broke was a huge deal in the UK, and mm-hmm. it was when I was watching a lot of movies, and I, uh, I really enjoy his his earlier films, and then I feel like he's made some very strange choices in his career, and yeah, uh, I really like the Aladdin remake. I think he the stuff he adds to that is fantastic. I think he's a very, um, he's a very astute director but he's made some bad films and it was really nice for me to see him what i thought was a really really well made film i thought it was really well directed and edited and and it and it gave the humor drama time to unfold again the the jake is the other side of this like he completely elevated not just the his script work but just being on screen like he's he's really good at having just that magnetic focus on screen in fact all the cast were great i thought yeah um, he's got, he's got was, real real presence there. yeah but it, i guy rich is one of those directors where i just i keep wanting him because there was a time where people were talking about him as the uk tarantino and i keep thinking like i really want you to make a good movie where people sort of realize that you're good again because his last couple of movies have basically done nothing at the theater and popped straight up on prime and I feel like he almost deserves better than that, if that makes sense. Where do you uh, think he went wrong? Like, why do you think... Madonna. <laughs> I, that's what I was thinking. That's it. I, I was mean, thinking that's, it. That's a sliding doors moment. What was yeah, that movie where, he, where Madonna gets stuck on an island? With the, something the, away. The Swept something Away remake. Yeah. Swept right, Away. That's, that's his sliding doors moment. There's a yeah. Gwyneth Paltrow version of him who didn't meet Madonna and make really <laughs> interesting movies the rest of his life. So I, I, so I think I don't, I don't want to go so far as to say that I fully disagree, but Swept Away is only his third feature. And I feel yeah. like we forget about that because I feel like, so Lockstock, good. Snatch, really good. Swept Away, awful. Revolver, good. Rock and Roller, good. Sherlock Holmes 1 and 2, good and like, what? Um... The Man from Uncle is a movie that I didn't like the first I time didn't. I saw it. Oh my I god! Like I know you love that film, don't you? I really just I, I love it. Love. I yeah. really I, love it. I, I, I that's, yeah, I love it. I think it. I would like it more now because I think I liked it more the second time I watched it. But I also have a hard time with the Army Hammer of it all now. But that's a whole other yeah. discussion. But then it's King Arthur movies bad. I thought the Gentleman was perfectly mm-hmm. fine. Wrath of Man mm-hmm. is perfectly fine. Like mm-hmm. he's making the same kinds of movies now. Um, and I think they're generally pretty good, and he's just like, he doesn't have that initial like cachet that he had at the start. Like, because Lockstock and Snatch are both amazing. Those are, and then he, he made yeah, two great classic. movies, two great movies, and then one god awful one. But like the two that came after it are also good. <laughs> like, he, yeah, but that so, god awful one stopped all that chatter about him being the next big thing. It just immediately stopped. Yeah, but like, have you seen? Have you seen Rock, Rock and Roll? Like, I would say that Rock and Roll yeah, is on the same Rock, level. It's on the same level as Lockstock, at least. Like, it's. it's, not, it's I don't cool. think it is. You it's think not, it's on the same it's level? Not, I don't think not. it is. It's a good it's movie. Not. I think it's a fine movie. I don't think it's it's anywhere near the level of Snatch and Lockstock, though. I think I think I, it's like I think it's up there in terms of like continuing a theme. I mean, just what I'm trying to say is that like I don't think it's that out of the ordinary for a director to like start big and then like have a faltering moment and then just be like relatively consistent. Like he's not it's bad. Hard. It's hard to make a good movie. I think at the end of the day, it's very, yeah. very difficult to make a good movie and to sustain greatness as a director, like even Spielberg, even Scorsese, mm-hmm. even they have holes in their filmography that you have. Every, gonna, every director know. has a 1942. It's just a thing. <laughs> I thought you were but, talking about Air America is way worse than 1942. <laughs> But I, I think it's I was a... really hoping for Man from Uncle for Guy Ritchie. I was really, really hoping that that would kind of be like 
a franchise for him. Um, but obviously, for obviously, obvious reasons, it wasn't. It Although didn't I will work say, out. I will say that. Um, so I haven't seen Operation Fortune yet, but I do appreciate Guy Ritchie's like ongoing collaboration with Hugh Grant at this point. I think he's a good. Thing. <laughs> it's fantastic. I I think they've got a really nice. <laughs> they've got a really nice thing going on, and it's a great. Yeah. I like this kind of era of Hugh Grant movies as well. I think. Yes. Oh yeah. He's, he's done amazing. so well of transitioning from that kind of floppy haired, bumbling yeah. British guy, like from yeah. from when we were kids but i mm-hmm. think he's great you know yeah. what you guys were talking about rock rock and roller there's toby kebble in that i thought he would be such a big deal after that movie and he has consistently worked since then like he's found a lot of work since then but he's never become the big big movie star that i kind of thought he might mm. have been because i remember watching him in, in rock and roller and thinking like this guy's really good i really enjoyed him but then he just has not well, done anything in, huge on uh, his own in a, in a parallel thing like toby kebble did a couple of really critically well-received things like rock mm-hmm. and rolla and the first season of black mirror yep. and then he was in fan four stick and yeah. you know and he ben did Rose. and he made a bunch of, and then he made and then he did a, like a he his career sort of mirrors um sam worthington's to the point where like started out with a couple of really great things and then made stuff like wrath of the titans in, which they start I'd together say in, he's, you know? like, I'd say he's better. He's more successful than Sam Worthington, though, in that we don't hear about him too much, but I'd say Toby Kebbell is actually a successful actor in that he just is very consistently has been working for a very long time now. Mm-hmm. And well, to me, if you're an actor, isn't that all you're looking for? Like, you just kind of have that consistent paycheck, and I'm sure he's not thing... an A-list actor in the slightest, but, like, you know, I, th- I think he's done very well for himself. I just thought he would be a bigger deal, that's all. I didn't know if Sam Worthington was really going to be a big deal. He was the interesting thing to me is that Sam Worthington has also been um, consistently acting, like consistently working, and when he's not like the focus of some major thing like Avatar, he's actually a very interesting performer, I think. He did a, he did a series uh, about the Unabomber in which he's scenery. great. Um, he did that. Um, he was in a really... It's not a, it's not a good movie, but it's basically a remake of, I think it's of Then There Were None, um, with Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> called Sabotage, and like what? Oh yeah, it's uh, <laughs> and he's like it's not a good movie, but he's super interesting in it. Like he's always yeah. an interesting part of whatever he's in. I think, um, <laughs> I and, unless I, it's something I, like Avatar when he's just super yeah. bland, you know. Like, well, that's just so Avatar bland. though. But I yeah. I hold Toby Kebbell up a little higher because that also he he was in the uh, he's Koba he was in Planet of the Apes movies yeah he's in the he's, mm. he's I mean maybe that's another thing is that Toby Kebbell is amazing in Dawn yeah. of Planet of the Apes but he's also replaced with CG so it's we yeah. don't I bet you, you know. there's lots of people who don't realize it's even him mm. yeah that's true you know, we, but I, we I all know but like average Joe Public maybe not. But in a way, I, I like. I suppose the point is, does it matter? Like Toby Kebbell might not have a lot of public recognition, but I still think he's a very, very successful actor. And like, we were talking about it about was it with you? I can't remember who I was talking about. But like about the best kind of character actors are people that yeah, you, you don't re- know they, who they are. You don't know who they are. Like you, they yeah. don't have mm. any sort of street cred, if it were. Like they, yeah. they're just they just work, and you go, damn, that person's good. Yeah, and like you the never Toby, think about them again. It's really like the Toby, like the Toby yeah. Jones of the world, who like yes, ninety yeah. percent of people you went, who's that guy? They'd be like, I don't fucking know, but I've seen him in twelve movies in the past. Yeah, 10 yeah. yeah, absolutely, you know? totally. Yeah, but I, anyway, I agree. Toby Kebbell is is great in rock and roll. Um, um so co- coming back to um, uh, Guy Ritchie's The Covenant, uh, how did you? Did you have a favorite out of the, the, the three thirds of this movie? So you've got the, the action set piece at the beginning and then that middle third, which felt like a stage play to me, including an amazingly shot monologue and delivered monologue. It was, it was very theater, that middle third. And then the Ura last third, like which, <laughs> which part of that movie kind of worked the, for you? The first third for me. The first one for you? Not yeah. the middle? I say middle for me. Middle for me. Uh, so my problem with the movie actually is I think that it is like I I think that the first third, which is basically the Darcelin show, is great, and I think that the second third, which is the Jakey G's show, is also great and actually wonderfully performed. Yeah. And I think that before we even talk about the third act, I think that the film goes maybe a little bit too far to be like being stuck on the phone on hold a lot is as bad as being stuck in. The, in <laughs> Afghanistan, 
I think it's a little bit too, like, it equates those things a little bit too much. <laughs> like, I think that one of those plights is worse than the other. I don't know. Only one of them involves it, being shot. Think it's, does it suggest that they're as bad as each other? Uh, the, I, for me, the tone was very much like, look at the hardship I'm enduring on hold. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, oh, I, like, I, I, I agree with that. I didn't really pick that up, but it is funny. That is a very funny take on it. Like, <laughs> I mean, the section, yeah, the section it before is just... like, Dar Salim, like, carted him across the, the Afghani yeah. desert, half dead, being hunted by the Taliban, and the second half is like, I have PTSD and I'm on hold a lot. Yeah, I but I, I read that as frustration, like, the clock is ticking. Like, I don't mean to diminish the PTSD of it all, but <laughs> just like, I just, like, someone in the film could have been like, you know you're home, right? Like, you know you <laughs> But No, that's I think not the point, me, but like, it just, it, it just felt a little weird. I feel, I feel I like that, maybe it. it's just that the first third and the second third and the third third seem a little bit disconnected from another in terms of, like, tone and style, and I don't, mm-hmm. like, I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying it doesn't quite, like, click in the same, in the way that I feel like it should. See, I think the first third, it's like, that is a great war movie. That's an excellent, excellent war movie. And you really could have started and ended with that. But we've seen, maybe not that specific movie, but we've seen war movies done many, many times. And I think that nowadays, one of the more interesting facets of war movies is not necessarily the action on the ground, but it is the effect that that has on somebody Oh, yeah. or it's not somebody else, but it's somebody afterwards and, and what they're dealing with. And that's such a human thing that I think we don't, unless you've been there, we can't really understand what those men and women go through. Like, we just have no idea what's going on in their brain space when they do come home. And I like that they made his house, like, he's in Santa Clara, California. Like, they didn't put him into some middle America nowhere kind of thing where it was mm-hmm. just such a bleak life. Like he seems to live like a very swishy life over there. Like it's mm-hmm. a nice house, like all that kind of stuff. It was very nice. And you, that kind of struck me because you don't really see that. Most times you see military people coming home, they go home to like a really small town mm-hmm. and their existence there seems very, no offense to small town people, but it's just like, it seems very simple. Very, very small. small, very simple. And just very like, you know, your life will always be defined by you're you're the guy who lives in the village who is the soldier guy. But mm-hmm. when you live in that part, like you, you live in LA basically, or like Santa Clara, or I think it's Santa Clara, right? That's where they said. Yeah, that. I think so. Yeah. Sorry, now all um, I can hear in my head is is um, he's the only soldier in the village. <laughs> 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 um, but, anyway. but yeah, like I I just think it's interesting that they put him into like not just a big city, but a you know what we would most of us would consider like a flashier almost kind of affluent type of city and and his, oh, yeah. thriving, his circumstances thriving look business, affluent loving, too right loving like, relationship yeah yeah and i i find it like i i thought that was a really interesting part of it and um and also jake's just great jake's great I mean, maybe for me uh, maybe what it comes down too, to though. is that, that like that. maybe i just wanted to see more of dar salim in the middle He's so good. He is very, very good in the movie. Like, I feel like the movie. I, like... Think, I think it's better that we didn't though, because the whole I my read of him being on hold wasn't um, compared to being dragged through the desert, but the frustration of the ticking clock of his this guy who saved him that he's got yeah. a covenant for the t- <laughs> like he is a he every day that passes. Is t- <laughs> Sorry, uh, that in other words, been defined for me. I just feel compelled to use it. Uh, um, <laughs> like the clock is ticking and this guy who saved him every hour that passes is yeah. him dying and i think by by us as the viewer being separated from seeing him surviving in afghanistan we don't know if he's still alive so we're in then we're in jake's head if we've been given this uh, this uh like omniscient view that he's actually fine and we do get that in the end but if that big chunk of time where we don't know if he's still alive in fact we we don't know uh what even happened after he gets arrested we learn when Jake does, which was, I, I had a little issue with that, but it was, it was more of a, the way that was told, but I kind I mean, of I guess, like how there's a big chunk where we don't, just like him, yeah. we don't know. And we're trying to find out what if he is dead. I mean, I guess if it did cut back to, to, to Ahmed, it might diminish what you're talking about. And like, I don't disagree yeah. with anything you're saying. I just, for me, I feel like the tone shift didn't, didn't quite work. And then when it shifts again for the third for the third act. I think I think that each of the acts on their own are great. 
it just didn't slot together in quite the way that I wanted it to. That, that, it's like it that, feels that like it's, yeah. it feels like it's like I don't know how to phrase this, but it feels like it's it's almost great. Like it's a really good movie, and it's almost great, and I can't quite call it great. And I find maybe it's just that I'm frustrated by that. So I, I for me, I don't know how you feel, but the it accelerated so fast when he decides to go back. It's like, well, I'm back and let's speak to this guy and I'm back now and oh we found him and yeah, the third it, act is it accelerated. Rushed, sure. it, yeah. it it got straight down to it. There was very little after the amount of character time and space we'd had in the middle third, it didn't give any of that. It's like no, he's back and it's one truck journey away and then they're at the dam and so on. It it, it turned into more of an action movie, and I'm sure that was the intention because it's the climax of the movie, but um especially as there was so much build up in the first and second thirds, uh, mm-hmm. especially when, when all the military stuff doesn't have that rushed feel in the first third, I think it's much better for it. So uh, I, I agree with you. I think the, um, especially right at the end when it, the, 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 the camera viewpoint is very much from the, the American military saviors like raining fire and I think there may have been a more interesting way to just show that, but um, I mean, on the on the other hand, we we talked a lot about Jake Gyllenhaal and Dar Salim, and Dar Salim is a guy who like I hope we get to see more of. He's actually a very successful actor. He's Iraqi born, but he's Danish, and he's been in a ton of stuff in Denmark and a lot of the stuff that I've seen. Like he's in a great uh, Nordic show called The Bridge, which is it's a great show. You should definitely like check it out if you get a chance. Um, but that's really all I know him from because he works in Denmark. <laughs> um, mm. But I hope we get to see more of him. But also, like, Johnny Lee Miller is in this. And even though he's only mm. in it for a little bit, he's great. And Emily Beecham mm. shows up and she's great. And mm. even Alexander Ludwig, who I'm a little bit hot and cold on, I thought was really mm. good in this part of mm-hmm. this film. I feel like one of the things we don't. We talk a lot about Guy Ritchie's movies in terms of, like, their tone and pacing and, like, the specific, like, camera style he doesn't really employ in this movie but often does um the way he like tells stories but i think he's also very good at getting performances out of people Mm. um and i feel like this movie's a good example of that because everyone who's in it is is pretty solid yeah i didn't recognize anthony star without his blonde hair as well so i thought he He surprised me i was not expecting him to show up because when they were like oh like is this like private military i was like yeah and then like What's his name on the boys? What's his name on the boys? Homelander, yeah. Homelander, yeah. Homelander showed up and I went, oh shit. (laughs) But Anthony Starr, again, like he's another one who, I mean, he's, now he's famous for the boys, but he was also on Banshee, which I haven't watched a lot of, but everything I've seen is great. Mm. And um, he's also, I believe, Australian. So his North American accent is, oh, he's New Zealand. He's he's a Kiwi. Oh, is he? Um, but his American accent is great, and he's he's really good. Like he just he's one of those guys now who every time I see him in something, I'm like, oh, it's that guy. I'm really happy he's here. <laughs> so I just think, oh, it's Homelander. He's gonna fuck some shit up now. <laughs> yeah, Homelander's such a terrible character. Like in a in a, in in a the good best way. way. In yeah, the best way like, possible. He's a horrible human being. But yeah, yeah. this is. I mean, we could talk. Boys, we could so. talk about the boys at length. Not about the boys. Uh, but uh, yeah, Anthony Starr so, is the MVP of that show for me for sure. So you put all these three like disparate parts of this movie together. How many stars did, the, did this land for you? Rachel, go ahead. I'm 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 <laughs> going to say I'm going to say three. I think it's a perfectly fine movie, and I think it's generally good. Three stars. I I would say three if if it was any other actor, but because Jake's in it, and I do think him and Darceline do such a great job together. I bump it up to a four because of because oh. of those two i mean i i i was gonna say exactly the same thing so yeah so, <laughs> so, thanks thanks for that rachel brilliant my, my one intelligent comment has gone um yeah it's uh, it's a four star movie for me i really really enjoyed it i i liked the different sections of it i especially loved when it became really the- uh, like a, a theater play in the middle and yeah I do tend to like movies like I, that too. Yeah, I am, like I don't I'm mean to diminish. With her, I'm uncomfortable with how jingoistic it came at the end, but it's still 
Uh, I kind of expected that. Anytime I see American military movies, Uh, like I just assume that the what they're doing is trying to get people to enlist in the army. (laughs) To find interesting that like it's a Guy Ritchie movie of all directors to take this on, like you know, which not saying British directors cannot do American military movies, but whenever I see an American military movie, I just assume any military movie in any country. That's true, but the the first third kind of sidestepped that. I thought it does. I thought thought it was really interesting that it did it. I love the interplay between them all and how how realistic that was as well. And so one thing. Sorry, I was going to say one thing is with you know especially now that i don't want to say the war is finished i mean technically i suppose it is but mm-hmm. now that I, you know that end note that they had about um you know the americans left in 2021 and then the taliban took over immediately however like yeah and and that was i remember being mm-hmm. really really sad about that because i just oh, i God. felt terrible for all especially for all the women oh, um God. who are living so in sad. afghanistan like i just think yeah. it's one of the most horrible horrific things it's ever so yeah now when I see movies that use the Afghanistan war, they talk about like, everything that happened after 9-11. Mm-hmm. Now that that kind of, the American side anyways, the chapter of that has closed for them. Mm-hmm. I find it, I find those movies a lot more interesting now to watch. And so I think this is the first one that I've seen that incorporates the fact that um, the Americans mm-hmm. left Afghanistan. And I yeah. think that that's a really interesting layer to put on top to think like it's, even though for the Americans it might be done, it is not done for the people who actually live there. And, and like they said, all the interpreters and everything like that, a lot of them are still hiding yeah. out. A lot of them died and things like that. So I, I that for me, I think that's an interesting layer on this time, kind of thing. And that, that was a really big, like, oof moment as well. When, yeah. when they get out and you've seen how terrible the Taliban are, there's an elements of them torturing and killing people that were not able to give up the information they wanted. Like, terrible, terrible things that we know are factually true. And then that just the text on the end was like the Americans left on the Taliban took over. Yeah, and then yep. it's, like, it's just that was. Well, and also like, you know, the best way they've murdered, they've like executed. I can't remember the number, but they've executed like everyone they can find who collaborated with the, with yeah. the Americans. Yeah, and and also as someone who's spent their whole life in education, the what makes me the most furious is the girls that were pulled out of schools and universities. Yeah. And promised they could go back, and now it's just been wiped clean. That no, no education for for girls at all. And it just reminds me of um, my, what's her name? Malala, 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 Malala. Malala. Got shot by the time of Malala. Like the scariest thing to religious extremists is a young, educated woman. Yeah. And I think that's that fascinates me. That's the only thing that scares these people, is especially young, educated females. And it. Um, I know I'm going off topic, but I'm, it makes me so passionately angry about what's going on there. So mm-hmm. yeah, it was it was a real uh, horrible moment, but it, it was very effective. And I think, <laughs> and I I would be really happy if it just faded out at that point before we got the, <laughs> before we got the dictionary definition, which was a really <laughs> stupid bad decision. But um, I'm I'll let it go. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Should have been at the start. I'll just reiterate. It should have. It and should have. And it would have. It, it wouldn't have made it that wasn't. much better, though. Would it? Though, it, it like would, we no. all still would have ragged on it, I even if so. it was at no. the. So beginning. I disagree. I it would have made it better because would've... we would have just forgotten about it. Like five yeah, minutes yeah. in, we would have <laughs> been like, "Okay, movie, tell me." It's like... kind of logical as well. It's it's a logical place for it to go. And I've saw I saw a movie recently, a sci-fi movie. Oh, it was um, uh, it was uh, Kylo Ren against dinosaurs, whatever that was called, and. The oh, six, of that, 65, yeah. The beginning of that movie has the most ridiculous exposition like titles. Like it doesn't let you work out anything by yourself. It's like, <laughs> okay, this is the time, these are the people, these are the humans, and now they're on this planet, and the, and his daughter's sick, so now just watch this. Like there's no brain work at all. But you move past it, so it's really weird to have the definition of the, the yeah. word right at the end. But I suppose um, it really does play to that idea of like you're you're just thinking your audience is really stupid. Like you just yeah. sat through a two hour movie and now at the end you're gonna be like, Oh, that's what that meant. Like that's yeah. what the title of this movie is because did they do the thing? I'm trying to think now. Did they do the thing where they somebody actually says this is my this is my covenant? Like did they do that? I don't think they did. Doesn't he say it in his monologue at some point? That he has a he has Does he? A does he actually needs- Someone, someone, I think someone says that he has like a covenant he needs to honor, or he says. Okay. It I think, I think it's in there, but. Because I always hate it. That's my biggest bugaboo is like in movies when they feel the need to do that. I hate that. Oh. Yeah, I watched it over a week ago, so I 
don't remember for sure is all I'm trying to say. But do you remember that movie? I think it's called Savages. It was Blake Lively and... Um, yeah, Taylor Kitsch and uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson. And it was directed. It's not good. Um, and, um, it's Oliver Stone. It's an Oliver Stone movie. It's an Oliver Stone movie. But at the very end, when they're like wrapping things up, and then like there's uh, Blake Lively is doing her like kind of voiceover, and then she goes, and the last thing she says, like, we were just savages. And I'm like, yeah, okay, we get it. Like, that's the name of the movie, like, blah, 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 yeah. move on kind of thing. And I thought that maybe they kind of sidestepped that here, but then. Yeah, they did the stupid definition thing at the end, which, yeah, yeah, just says your audience is dumb. There you go. It always reminds me of, I mean, lots of things remind me of lots of different satires, but there's a great, you've probably seen it, there's a great sketch by a duo on YouTube called Brit- Britannic, uh, and they have a Academy Award winning movie trailer <laughs> where, like, every scene in the movie trailer is, like, a toast to me, the humble protagonist, who is wealthy. <laughs> and the and like the end of the trailer is like casually summing up the moral of the story and awkwardly working in the movie title. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> every movie that does that reminds me of that because it's such a perfect satire. I will put that in the show notes so you can see it if you haven't seen it. It's an amazing sketch. I don't think I've seen it, so I will I will click on your show notes. Thank you, Matt. Excellent, excellent. And Simon, welcome back. You had some Wi Fi issues and now you're back. You didn't miss anything. We we're just still talking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't. You're not talking though, so maybe you can't hear us. I don't know. No nope, technical. He's, he's gone again. Awesome. Gone I am not going to edit this out. Simon's having technical difficulties, so we're just going to shoot the shit for a minute until he gets that worked oh, out. There he All is. Right. Can you hear my us? Wi-Fi. Yep. Can yeah. you hear me? Uh, my Wi-Fi just died. Maybe my take was too hot. I can't <laughs> What I was talking about now. Uh, yeah, sorry, it just died a death. Well, you are the rear admiral of hot takes. So. Uh, yes, less, less of the rear, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, four stars. Point yet? I don't know where you got to. Uh, it's fine. We should really move on to the next yeah. film, um, which also is, I mean, it's not an American military thing. It's a, it's action people being action-y. Uh, we're going to talk oh, about... Ex- so action. Extraction 2, starring Chris Hemsworth for Netflix, which came out this week. Uh, sequel to uh, Extraction 1, I guess, which came out in 2020, a movie that I did not like. Um, uh, and it's... Uh, how to sum up this movie? So, basically, Chris Hemsworth is the protagonist. His name is Chris Hemsworth, and he is the greatest mercenary of all time. And at the end of the last movie, he nearly dies. And this movie starts at that point, and he is rescued and taken to um, Dubai, I think it was, and mm-hmm. rehabilitated, and left with like a bum knee and a bad arm. And he goes to live in seclusion in in Austria, I think, because that's where you go to, you know, be in a cabin in the winter, in the summer, and then Idris Elba shows up and says, "I have a mission for you." And it's to do with your ex-wife. And then there's a five-minute montage, and he's healthy again, even though he spent the last 20 minutes complaining that he'll never be healthy again. And then he goes and saves his ex-sister-in-law and her children from a Georgian prison. And the rest of the movie is basically one long chase, um, including a 21-minute action sequence. Uh, which starts as a prison escape and turns into a car chase and then turns into a helicopter assault on a train. And I don't know. I'm going to go ahead and say that I liked this one. I thought this one was stupid fun. I really didn't like the first one. The first movie to me felt like a gimmick in search of a story. And this one felt like a story with a gimmick. And as, as a result was just dumb fun. And I enjoyed it. I feel like it gave Chris Hemsworth more to do on the acting front Um, Because it actually went into his backstory instead of just alluding to it. Um, The casting is great. The the direction is a lot more solid. The twenty one minute action sequence is clearly a cheat, but and a lot of the like invisible cuts with air quotes are are pretty visible. But it does a very good job of building uh, tension throughout and culminates in the second best train action sequence of the year, I would argue. <laughs> uh, which Simon was about to disagree with me on. But I don't know. What did uh, what did you think, Rachel? 
Uh, I liked it. I like I like action movies. This is a dumb action movie. I enjoyed dumb action movies. I didn't really like the first extraction either. I thought that the action sequences were good, but I didn't like all the other nonsense that they were doing in it. I thought it was just kind of silly. But this one, to me, that other nonsense was a lot more simple. And I think that that works a lot better if you just kind of keep it simple. You don't need to be so convoluted and, and mm-hmm. clever, I suppose. I think... Uh, the gym action sequence it's amazing you just oh yeah gym, the gym, gym equipment great. that's fantastic yeah the first one i remember there was like a decapitation that happens um that i just think is one of the coolest things i'd seen in an action movie in a while <laughs> and then in this one i liked when like the leg press he just like lets it go and it just crushes the dude i really enjoyed that yeah um but yeah i i liked it and i i like the ad of idris elba he's you know we talk about jake jones Hall. Idris is another one of those for me. Anytime he does something new, I always feel the need to watch him because I love him. Yep. And yeah, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of Chris Hemsworth as an actor. I have to admit, I don't think he's a very talented actor. I think he's good. He's kind of the Keanu and the Nick Cage thing where if you give him a very specific thing to do, he's good at that thing. But when you try to do other things with the exception of the hotel one, what was that hotel movie called? Not El Dorado. <laughs> what was that movie called? Psycho? Oh, um, you're talking about Bad Time at El Royale. At the El Royale. Oh, that one. Yeah. Okay. With the exception of that one, which I actually really liked Hemsworth in that, I'm I'm not the biggest Hemsworth fan. This is not that he just, he's pretty. He's very good looking to watch. But this, I think, is such a great vehicle for him. And I'd love to see them do more. I think that they did announce they're going to do a third one. I mean, this um, one, but, not, to, not to be a spoiler, but this one basically ends with a, are you ready for the third movie yet? Because, <laughs> like, basically. like it yeah. basically cuts and to I black think, on someone saying they're going to do a third one. So I think of all the stuff that the Russo brothers have been a part of post-Marvel, I think this is probably my, f- I say my favorite one. I think it's the only one that I genuinely like. Like, all the other things that they've done, I do don't really like them and this one yeah, though, like extraction because, two specifically because, i'm like i like it it's good that's because basically everything that they have done and been it's actively been and been actively involved in since since endgame has been kind of shit like it's been shit like, like i don't you, know what they they're to, doing but they get to claim that they're producers on everything everywhere but they don't seem <laughs> like they were maybe that involved no. in it like i know that it was like just an Agbo films release but like uh, Cherry was bad. The Gray Man is bad. Um, yeah, I just and their show uh, Citadel is awful. I, oh, I can yeah. I cannot. Oh, I don't. I I'm pretty good about looking for things to like about Citadel about shows and and, and movies that I watch. But I watched the I watched the first twenty minutes of Citadel and turned it. I off. forced you to watch it. I <laughs> yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't believe. I turned it off after twenty minutes. I am not the person who does that normally. I did exactly the it same. honestly makes me think that I don't think the Russo brothers are as good at movies as we think they are. And it's just yeah. because Infinity War and Endgame and uh, it's good not material. even just those. I mean, like Civil War, um, what's the other but, one? Winter Soldier. Those ones are really good. But I think that they're just good at, they were good at that. They were good at living within the vacuum of Marvel. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they're that great at doing their own thing. And I mean, I hope I'm proven wrong. I think extraction two is very good. And it's, it's kind of like R rated Marvel. Like they're able to do really cool action stuff um, in this one. So I, I hope they do better. I'd like for them to do better, but you know, they I didn't, even, they... I think it was a, I think only one of them wrote it though. Who wrote yeah. It? Just Joe. Um, just Joe. He wrote yeah. it. Um, my thing is that I, it's interesting because I do really like Infinity War and Endgame, and I do like uh, Winter Soldier and um, Civil War a lot. Like I'm a big yeah, Marvel. Yeah, I think nerd. they're great. Yeah. Um, I have been saying for a year, and Simon can back me up on this. I've been saying for years that I think they are terrible action directors. So I'm glad they're nowhere near this in terms of like the the direction. Actually of acting, yeah, yeah. Like actually being like hands on on set with like making choices about stuff. I think they are, I think they are, I guess the best way to put it is they're sort of like the journeyman filmmakers. I think that they show up, I think they're reasonably competent. I think they, when it comes to being like creatively interesting, they don't have a lot going on. No. You know, yeah, that's a good, a good yeah. analogy would be, I was reading this about something else, um, about AI bros, which apparently they are, which is 
fun of the discussion, but like shocking. Uh, I was reading an article by or a Twitter thread by a photographer who said that basically all the guys now who are AI bros are the same guys who, when he was in art school, would obsess over like lens choice and paper choices instead of like composition and color. You know, the people who are obsessed with the tools and not the craft. And I feel like the Russos might be like that as well. And that sounds a little harsh, but I feel like it's true because everything they've done. And even if you watch any of their behind the scenes stuff on say like infinity war, they talk about the cameras that they used and the way they chose to light something rather than anyone's performances or any like creative story choices. And I just find that really telling. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that, you know, I'm happy they produced this, but I'm glad that they did direct it. I guess it's <laughs> the short version of what I'm trying to say. And Sam Hargrave, I would argue, who is, I mean, he's most famous for being the Marvel stunt coordinator. Um, I think he's in the interim between Extraction 1 and Extraction 2, he's become a much better director. I don't know exactly what he's done in between those two things, but I think that the action itself is better, like better framed, better shot, better conceived. And I think that he gets a much better performance out of Hemsworth specifically. Um, I think this is generally the kind of movie where you cast people who you can know will show up and be reliable. But I think that Hemsworth in particular does much better work in this one. And I, mm -hmm. I'm willing to chalk that up to Hargrave knowing a bit better what to say or do with his actors. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Feel free to disagree with me or, or whatever. But he's no, uh, I don't like I uh, my you between the two of you, you've read out the entirety of my notes anyway. As, uh, <laughs> and Ra Rachel has completely. Uh, copied without even seeing my notes on on how I feel about <laughs> Hemsworth and the movie, and you've uh, you've nailed, nailed on the head about the Russos. I think I, I watched uh, we watched Winter Winter Soldier recently, and it doesn't it really doesn't hold up, and, and especially it was after we had quite a long discussion about the way they frame action, and it's impossible to watch after that discussion to to not see that like it's just not framed and cut well. So I didn't like the first extraction either at all. And this one, I adored it. I loved this film so much. It just like took every single element of the first one and made it better or made it mm -hmm. good. And I think you're totally right about Hemsworth. I'm not convinced that he... Uh, we had this discussion about him in Ghostbusters a few weeks ago. I don't <laughs> think he's a comfortable improviser. I don't. I really hated him in the... Uh, there was a film that was like Michael Bay's The Island, but not... And um, what was that called? Oh, the Where spider the, one? Oh, Spiderhead? Yeah, I think yeah, you're talking about Spiderhead. Spiderhead. He, was, he was not good enough. No. About, but that I wasn't a this, good movie to be. I was going to say that. That's, like, that's also true. Like, like nothing was good the, in that movie, this, so. This is like, <laughs> yeah, this is like oh, his yeah. absolute... Are we good? This is his perfect wheelhouse. Like, yeah. natural accent, looking great, emotional delivery of the emotional lines. He can do pathos as well, like, mm -hmm. which... Um, He's got that ability to, to oscillate between those two things, but also, like, sells an action scene. I was talking about Michelle Rodriguez the other day about um, how brilliant she is at selling action, how committed she is to action scenes. And I think he is, he's key to that, because when you've got a movie that's basically a stunt film with a story jammed in, and it didn't work so well in Extraction, but the balance was much better in two, you've got to have a lead that sells your action and... I, I watched this on my Oculus Quest 2 um, <laughs> on Netflix. You can activate the Void Theater, which is basically uh, a, a screen as big as you want the screen to be. You can wow. extend it. And so I watched this with headphones on, on a screen that was basically filled my periphery. And uh, let me tell you, that 21-minute action scene, there's a number of times where I was just holy shitting my way through, especially... Like, there's stages to that action scene, and the last stage on the train, from him getting on the train, like, minigunning helicopters to the near the end, where the absolute wonderful, and I can't say her name properly, is Gul Shifter Farahani. I'm really, really sorry if you're listening. <laughs> you're, you're amazing. I thought she was incredible. She's great. And her, her action scene, where she's fighting in the carriage, and then... Sh shoots shoots a guy the camera pans as she shoots a guy backwards through the carriage while screaming in his face basically i was standing up like shouting i haven't felt that motivated to shout at action cinema since fury road like that's how much i loved 
this film. Um, but what I what I did find out, I, I enjoyed it more than, say, John Wick 4. I think um, John Wick 4, the, uh, you can never replicate the, um, the Donnie influence. Like, Donnie was brilliant in Donnie and in John Wick 4 was was brilliant than more brilliant than than any other before in any action movie but generally speaking as an action movie this one worked better for me but it makes the same mistake as John Wick 4 in fact really all of the John Wicks that I feel like the second set piece in oh were they in Vienna Where were they yeah in the, Vienna in the, right, Vienna which was exceptional and, and had that gym scene and and when he there's one moment where he saves someone by uh, willfully destroying something so he can then hang on to it. Mm-hmm. Where I was just like, holy shit, like amazing, like amazing. It's like ballet when when action cinema is like ballet. You know that perfect editing, shooting, choreography, acting, beautiful. I thought it was an incredible scene, and then I really felt like it made the mistake of a lot of actual, other action movies is that it makes its final standoff low key, and yeah. emotional, and the pace just plummets and John, John Wick does this a lot and I have a problem every time it does it and I really wish I really wish these movies would look at Fury Road and go that Fury Road's line is like this like it doesn't have an emotional final moment where the, the goody and baddie look each other in the eye and talk about religion or politics and <laughs> roughly say things and there's a moment where there's salvation I, I don't want that in my climax (laughs) (laughs) i i want to be taken like i want that journey to end like fury road did you want want your action movies to to be like capitalism you want the line to go up (laughs) yeah i want the line to go up i want to have no breath left in my body at the end of that movie and i and i that's how i felt after the vienna scene and i enjoyed the last part i see what they were doing i thought it was very very good but it didn't have the pace of the first two set pieces and I, I kind of wish that that they'd gone big with the third one because he basically just snipes his way in just kills everyone then they have a face off and yeah. I wanted a bit more of the ballet there but really I, that's just being picky I thought it was exceptional I just loved it I mean I will so say when... I thought that um, uh, what's his name the the bad guy uh, Torniki I'm going to I'm going to mispronounce this so I apologize <laughs> but his name is Torniki uh, Gogrechiani, I think, is, is plays Zerab, the bad guy. I thought he was super good. And I did actually, as I agree with everything you're saying, but I actually really enjoyed the last confrontation. I thought that the like emotional stakes were, you know, at least as compared to the first one in the series, present, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's valid. Um, and I don't, it's not, I don't want to spoil exactly how it goes down, but I think that the the last moment in particular between them, they have this showdown and they have a big fight mm-hmm. and then the last mm-hmm. final moment yeah. between them <laughs> that's is good. basically yeah. perfect. Yeah. And, yeah. and harkens back to, I think it might be my favorite, it's my, maybe one of my favorite, like, good guy, bad guy final interactions since... I don't know if you guys have seen this, but there's a great movie from the 80s. Oh, maybe it's not great. I don't know. It's been a while since I've seen it. But there's a movie from the 80s that I low-key love called Wanted, Dead or Alive with Dolph Lundgren. Not Dolph Lundgren. Um, uh, what the hell is his name? I can see his face. Uh, uh, wow, I'm blanking on this super famous actor's name. Uh, he plays Roy Batty in Blade Runner. And he's the chairman of the board in Batman Begins. Blonde guy, super blonde guy. Come on, help me out. Uh, I'm usually the one that has to remember, so I... I Rutger Hauer. Rutger Hauer. Oh. Anyway, 80s movie with Rutger Hauer called Wanted Dead or Alive, and the bad guy is Gene Simmons. And I'm sorry this is a spoiler if you haven't seen this, like, 30-year-old movie, 40-year-old movie, (laughs) but... In the end, he brings the bad guy in. He's a bounty hunter, and the bad guy is the bad guy, Gene Simmons. And he's told right at the end that for bringing him in alive, there's a bonus. And he hands him over to the police. And the way he brings him in is he subdues him, and he gets handcuffs on him, and he puts a grenade in his mouth, in Gene Simmons' mouth. And he's told that for bringing him in alive, he gets a bonus. And he turns around, and he pulls the pit on the grenade and goes, fuck the bonus, and walks away. (laughs) And it's maybe my favorite good guy, bad guy ending of all time. (laughs) And this movie has a moment that is like that. And I really appreciate it. 
One thing I'd say is to what Simon was talking about, like at the end where the movie just kind of goes a bit too much into the, the, the emotional heart stuff. I find a lot of action movies, especially the more modern ones, and you bring John Wick up. And I love John Wick movies. I'm huge, huge, big, big, big John Wickian fan over here. Mm. But I think one of the issues is it's the same issue I have with horror in that all horror movies now feel the need to have like some sort of social messaging underneath it that they make super, super obvious. And it is basically the plot of the story. And I'm like, I get it. But not every new movie needs to be get out. It's the same thing with action movies now. I feel like they always feel the need to inject something about heart, something about you know something with that and I, i'm like not every action movie needs that and i feel like simon this could be the beginnings of our 90s action film discussion right. in that 90s action movies didn't give a shit about heart right they I, just, was about, I was thinking about commando all the way yes, through this movie you just have right. good action that is solid it is fun and it is yeah. it's like you understand that you are making a fun kind of stupid pretty ridiculous logic defying mm. film and mm. you just own that like face you said face off at some point and it made me think of the movie face off obviously mm -hmm. but like that movie is ridiculous but it's great at the same time but you don't really need any of like the heart or the, the you know any of those little emotional buttons or emotional beats that i feel like a lot of people think you need that in a balance for an action film and i think you do to an extent i think you need some of it but you don't need it to the extent that you tack it yeah. on as an epilogue to absolutely end your film. I think it's nice there for flavor, like the the mix. It's nice to have it in there, but on uh, uh, the rock level, like yes, a, we find out in the rock that he, it's about his daughter, and and he has he has feelings for his daughter. That's it. That's the emotional level, and the rest <laughs> is the rock. Like it doesn't it doesn't need to be any more than that. And I think yeah. that's the balance we're looking I mean, for. I don't I don't I don't need it in my climax to this action movie. I mean, there is a very agree, strong, yeah. in horror movies especially, but in this one as well, there is there is a pretty strong through line lately of, it's actually about trauma. It's actually about yeah. trauma. I don't know if you're aware of this, but that story was about trauma. <laughs> it's just, it's and, too much now. And like, and I, 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 it's important and it's interesting. And when it first got introduced, it was very interesting. But now it's like, come on, guys, we can move off of this. It doesn't, not, not everything needs to be about that. And I, mm. you know, it's fine. Yeah. It works when it when it does work well though it does work very very well but I just don't think a movie like Extraction Two is really where that needs to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will say though that it's any any movie that um, Daniel Bernhardt shows up in, I'm I'm always happy to see him because I know I'm going to get at least one really good fight. <laughs> so, yeah. Who is who is this person? Who's Daniel Bernhardt? Daniel Bernhardt is the uh, I think he's like the number two bad guy, oh, the, the guy. tall, slender guy who's the bad yeah, guy yeah. in all of these movies. Like he's he's <laughs> he the was, he's the club um, he guy was in, in John... Nobody. He was yeah, in he was nobody. one of the yeah. goons in Nobody. He was the the Atomic Blonde as well. He's a he was the guy in the in the stairway fight in Atomic Blonde. He's the Whoa, he's the he's in Bloodsport. He's in, he's in, in a lot. So I believe yeah. he was a stuntman. For I think he was Keanu Reeves' stuntman for a time. Yeah. Um, but that's how he started out because him and Chad Stahelski are like buddies mm -hmm. um, from yeah. the stunt world. And so he got more he's... stuff in John Wick and then from there just kind of mm -hmm. took off. Yeah, on. he's definitely part of the whole 8711. Yeah, uh, he's crew. fantastic. Uh, and he's also like, I um, can't remember, he's got like black belts and karate and at least one other uh, mm -hmm. martial art as well. He's. He's Swiss. He doesn't talk a lot, but when he shows up, you're like, okay, we're going to get at least one really good fight out of this. He's so good. He's so um, good. I really, really like him. He and he actually got his start on screen. You're right, because it was The Matrix. He He's one of the agents in The Matrix. Uh, the Matrix Reloaded, mm -hmm. specifically. He's one of the new agents. Um, oh. And, uh, yeah, and he's in John McQuan. He's a hitman in John McQuan, the guy he fights in the club. Oh. Um, but he's also, like, he's just great. He's always he's got a really interesting presence. He's and he's always good for the physical action, and I'm always really happy to see him. I really liked him in Nobody on the bus. I think he's really really good in Nobody. I mean, he's good yeah, in mean, everything he does. But yeah. yeah, I also thought he like that. The bus sequence on in Nobody is like such a such a great such a great version of what we're talking about, and like the level of emotion that an action film I needs to that. have. The bus sequence yeah. is a perfect version of that. I love Nobody. I actually am now going to watch it tonight <laughs> because we just brought it up. I love that movie so much. When I first saw it, I think I watched it every... You were asking before about like diving deep into like an obsession about something. I watched mm. that movie for the first time whenever it came out last year. And then Two I think ago. for... 
like or however for a month straight i literally i'm not it's not even a joke i watched it every single day because i just <laughs> loved it so much and then i would just have it in the background i really loved it and i haven't seen it in like six months and now i feel like i should go watch it i would actually wow. think about watching it tonight but we actually watched it like a week two weeks ago maybe it's such a good it's, movie it's, it's so i everything good. about that movie i love it's so so I mean, good I, I know it's i, I know that it's by name. it's written by the guy who wrote john wick um, yep. and it's produced uh, uh, and it's what's his name uh derek Colstead. daniel Sun- derek Colstead, yeah um and it's produced by the 87 11 crew so mm-hmm. like it makes sense but it is like it's the best john wick imitator since john like since john wick basically okay, like, absolutely um i love it and, and i i don't know if they're doing another one i don't know but honestly i would really love to see bob odenkirk continue his streak as the new dad action hero because <laughs> i'm i mean we're all a bit tired of liam neeson at this point and <laughs> The stuff that other actors are doing in the UK. I just, I, Bob Odenkirk is so good. In the I world. love Bob Odenkirk in that, yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Better Call Saul only made me love him that much more, so it's good. I mean, he's, he's good at everything he does. I don't know if you've seen the Fargo TV show, but he is excellent in the first season of that. He is Mr. Show, after all, isn't he? He is, yeah. He is. <laughs> anyway, um, so how many stars are we all giving to Extraction 2? Um, I'm uh, Simon. You go ahead. It's a four from me. I just wish it would have been a clear five if they had kept the momentum into that third act. Uh, it's some of the most enjoyable action cinema I've seen in a long, long, long time. And maybe it's because I watched it on a screen as big as my eyes. But um, <laughs> the it was and some of the there's some. It's worth mentioning there's some bullshit camera in there in the first third especially there's some way everything's way too close and cut too quickly but then suddenly it stops like all the action past that point is brilliantly shot so four stars from me hmm. how about you and rachel i'm gonna say three but like a really strong three i don't yeah. think three is out of five is bad i really enjoyed it i had a lot of fun with it um maybe it's because we're doing it up against covenant and i feel like there needs to be a <laughs> like a great like difference a, like a between curve. the two of them yeah like there uh, needs to be some sort of differentiation between these two movies um but i really love that I, it's a it's a very strong strong three i think it's a great action movie and i am and now actually excited to watch a third one i remember watching the first extraction being like i don't even think i got through the whole thing i was like yeah whatever this is fine and then um when the only reason i watched extraction two is for this i had really no intention of watching it um, hmm. when when it came out so and turns out great movie so thank you guys for for telling me to do this yeah you're welcome uh for me it's also a, a three a strong three like if we gave half stars maybe three and a half but we yeah i would give it a three and a half yeah um but yeah three stars i think it's 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 you know again unlike the first one it's fun and it has an actual story it wants to tell and it tells it oh. and the action is inventive and it's exactly the kind of movie that I would love to see a series of like eight of over time, you know? Um, so they should put these things in cinemas as well. This is yes. I, uh, yeah, I'm fun. actually jealous of the way you got to watch it, Simon, because I actually yeah. think this kind of movie would be amazing to watch on a big screen. Like this yeah. would be so cool. Actually, it was just looking, at my, the... just looking at my notes and one of the things I wrote, I guess I didn't timestamp my notes, but one of the things I wrote at one point was like, I wish I'd seen this in a theater with a crowd. Yeah. yeah. The I best think... thing about the, the what the Netflix app on the Oculus Quest Two is worth buying the headset alone because the normal default setting is your own. You're in a log cabin on a red couch with a uh, like a 70 inch TV on your wall, and you've got views of the mountains out the window. When you press play, all the lights dim, oh, and you wow. just sit in that ambiance with a little table in front of you, and it's so persuasive. I tried to put my glass on the table. <laughs> <and I> was... <laughs> I was holding in my hand, watching, watching a movie, and I put my glass out, and it just sort of fell onto the floor. And oh no! So, um, and now they've added this what they call the void theater. It's even better. Like it's a great way to watch movies. I mean, I'm not going to lie. When when Apple announced their uh, Vision Pro, my first, I had two thoughts immediately. One was that in five years, when I can, when it's affordable, I will no longer, need, I will no longer need a computer monitor. And I will also, this will be the way I watch movies, pretty much. Mm-hmm. And that and that is why. So, yeah. Marvelous. Marvelous. Mm-hmm. One, wunderbar. 
Uh, <laughs> so I think we're going to wrap it up there. We're at an hour and a half, which is a little over time, but we have a, a wonderful, a wonderful third person. So I think it's worth it. Plus we had a, a great discussion about subways. So um, <laughs> and that, that is not sarcastic. I am. I, that was a great discussion. Um, Rachel, where can people find you these days? Uh, where can they find me? I'm on Twitter at underscore Rachel KH and, um, all of my stuff goes on my site, which is rachelho.com. Nice. And you're currently still the editor of exclaim.ca for film. And you I write currently for... still am as far, as far as I know. Yeah. yeah. I still, I still hold that spot. <laughs> and you still write for the globe and that shelf and, uh, a bunch of other places. I haven't right? written for either in a little while, but let's see, where else do I write? I've written, um, when is this coming out? Today. <laughs> Today. Okay. Sunday. Never mind then. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. So yes, uh, uh, editor at Exclaim, which most of my stuff is at. I write r documentary reviews over at POV Magazine. Every now and then, I might try to convince uh, Globe and Mail that I'm worthy of writing something for them, which is always fun to do. Hmm. And yeah, and uh, other than that, oh, sometimes it's slash film as well. That's always fun to do. Hmm. Nice. Well, you're certainly a bigger deal than both of us. So thank you for being here. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to the first novel. We'll just crack that out as well in between all your fancy writing time. Just get some, get some fiction in there too. Yeah. Uh, one day. One day. Good. Um, well, everyone go check out Rachel's stuff. Her links will be in the show notes. Um, and thank you to everyone who's listening. Once again, if you uh, would like to support us, we do have... Uh, a Patreon and Kofi and everyone who um, is a Patreon subscriber does get access to our bonus chats, which we now produce every week, including this week. Um, but if you like, you can also give us a five star review on your podcasting platform of choice or like subscribe. Uh, and now I've actually gotten good about posting our episodes on YouTube again. So if you listen to this on, on YouTube, subscribe to the channel and smash that like button. And those things help immeasurably. Um, you can find us on the socials. I am at Matthew AF uh, on Twitter and Instagram. The show is at Awesome Friday CA on Twitter and Instagram. Simon is at Temporary Pen on Twitter only. Um, we record <laughs> this here. I mean, Twitter Twitter only as long as uh, Twitter Twitter exists in a meaningful way. We'll say, um, you know, once we fully transition to blue sky or mastodon or whatever instagram facebook instagram's replacement is going to be we'll discuss it then uh we record this here in vancouver on the unceded lands unceded ancestral lands of the musqueam Tsleil-Waututh, and squamish nations rachel in uh toronto which is yeah. on the territory of the mississaugas of the credit the anishinaabe the chippewa the haudenosaunee and the wendat peoples thank you google i appreciate it <laughs> Thank you so much for listening and for joining us on this awesome Friday. Bye.